This little mini lecture is to help you feel a little bit more comfortable with um, chapter 23, signal transduction. And let's just walk through a couple of the signaling pathways that are in your textbook. What I want you to be able to do from this chapter is one, I want you to be able to recognize different receptor types. We'll go through that. Okay. I want you to be able to recognize second messengers. such as cyclic AMP and calcium, uh, IP3 and DAG. So we'll talk about that too. There are lots of proteins involved in signaling pathways. Okay, Lots of very common ones like phospholipase C and PKA and like I said, the different receptors. So I've provided you charts, and let's just put a slide over there really quick, put it at the end. Okay, so I've given you four charts that I highly suggest you fill in before you take the quiz and have with you, because it's not important for me for you to remember or memorize all of this. It's about applying your knowledge. So if you can have descriptions of receptors and what they interact with and the G proteins and the different types of signaling okay and keeping PKA and PKC and phospholipase C beta and phospholipase C gamma and the different roles of calcium and other secondary second messengers it's going to make the quiz really easy i've also for instance, this is one giving you a list of figures. I'm a paper person, have them printed out, have them up on your computer so you can flip to them. Because this way you don't really have to memorize anything, you just have to be able to understand and interpret. Okay, so fill in your charts, have the pathways available. Obviously, go through the chapter objectives um, like you always do. But let's just talk about components of a signaling pathway. So there's lots of different receptor types. We talked about ligand-gated ion channels last chapter, about how these um, bind ligands and open up. We talked about voltage-gated ion channels. They're not really called receptors because they don't bind something, but regardless, we've gone through these. So what we're focusing on in this chapter are the G protein coupled receptors, so no GPCR, that's how we abbreviate it. We're talking about enzyme linked receptors, which means once these receptors bind their ligand, a catalytic reaction happens, right? They're enzymes. The ones we're focusing on are receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, hopefully you know by now a kinase is an enzyme that adds phosphates. I draw it like this to another molecule. Okay. So we have receptor tyrosine kinases, which will phosphate a tyrosine. And it really drives me crazy because the one letter code for tyrosine is actually Y, not T. The other type we'll talk about is receptor serine threonine kinases. And I once in a while see them abbreviated, most of the time I write it out, which means they phosphorylate the amino acid serine or threonine. 
And then the other type, so these are all membrane-bound receptors. The other type are the intracellular receptors. And one of your first um, objectives is to know the difference between a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic ligand. So your ligand is your signaling molecule. It is the thing that binds the receptor. These, oops, these ligands up here are all hydrophilic, right? They like water, and we know that outside of the cell is lots of water. You also remember that your phospholipid bilayer is hydrophobic because it's made of all those lipids. So ligands that are hydrophobic can easily move through the plasma membrane and they bind a receptor that's inside, intracellular, inside the cell. So steroid receptors, steroid hormones. Um, they're called hydrophobic. Sometimes they're called uh, lipophilic. They love lipids. And so they can go right through that plasma membrane and bind the receptor inside the cell. So let's look at our three um, transmembrane receptor types. Okay, so these are all transmembrane, and we focus on the differences in their structure. Okay, and I know this is a, a crappy slide with regards to reading it, um, but get used to doing the visualization, okay, because that's going to take you farther than trying to read sometimes a lot of unnecessary information. Okay. So this first one up here, oops, oops, is our G protein coupled receptor. And you recognize it because it has seven transmembrane regions. Also, maybe your brain is like, oh, think of all those start, stop signal sequences, right, to make that. Or maybe you've forgotten that. The other thing that's important about G protein coupled receptors is that they interact with trimeric, nah, trimeric G proteins. Okay. Trimeric G proteins we will talk about in another slide as contrast to monomeric G proteins. So G protein coupled receptors have seven transmembrane regions and if it's not drawn to show that you look for the alpha beta gamma G protein. right? So you can recognize those. Receptor tyrosine kinases you will recognize have one transmembrane region, and they have to dimerize when they come together. So they actually form a homodimer. Homo means the same. And so if you see two <coughs> receptors coming together when the ligand binds, we're talking receptor tyrosine kinases. These are interesting because when they come together, they autophosphorylate, so they self-phosphorylate, and they actually self-phosphorylate each other, which is not exactly self, but because they're basically the same, it's called autophosphorylation, and so there's a bunch of Y tyrosine amino acids, ah, sorry, and so they add phosphates to themselves. Okay. The key 
also in their name is that they are a kinase. So when you look at a pathway with them, they are actually going to add phosphates to other proteins. Similar and different to receptor serine threonine kinase, right? A big difference is it has two types of receptors that come together. Sometimes this is drawn as two different ones, like showing here different colors. Sometimes they come together um, as a hetero, uh, what's the word for four? Hetero, I had it written somewhere. Anyways, four um, receptors total coming together, two type two, two type one. What's interesting about these, these are also kinases. So one of the things they do is the type 2, which is shown here in red, will phosphorylate the type 1. Okay, and it phosphorylates it on a serine residue. These are also kinases, so they phosphorylate other proteins. And we'll look at these individual pathways in just a second. All right, G proteins. So you know the G protein receptor, seven transmembrane domain. They interact with the trimeric. So we're just gonna focus on the top up here. They interact with the trimeric um, G proteins. And what I want you to see is that the alpha and the gamma subunits are lipid anchored. And they stay lipid anchored. So these proteins do not go into the cytoplasm. They stay anchored to the plasma membrane. I want you to also know that subunit A is the one that is the GTP ACE. So it's the part of this um, trimeric complex that binds GTP. And for all G proteins, when they're bound to GDP, they're inactive. And when they're bound to GTP, they are active. So what happens to the trimeric ones is the G protein coupled receptor binds the ligand, it activates the protein and GTP is exchanged for GDP. Okay. So when G, did I say that right? Let me say it again. GDP is exchanged for GTP. So it's exchanged, doesn't become it. They actually kick out the GDP, bind to GTP. This is done by GEF proteins, which are guanine nucleotide exchange factors. Whenever you see the word factor, it means protein. Wow, it just drives me crazy. Okay. So a protein GEF comes in here, helps exchange. Now the alpha subunit is bound to GTP and it is active. What's important is the beta gamma subunits stay together and they are also now active once they have broken away from the alpha protein. So these can cause signal transduction, alpha can cause signal transduction. The way you turn off a G protein, and that's true for the trimeric or monomeric, is you hydrolyze GTP back to GDP. So let's make sure we understand this. Up here, this is an exchange. So you release one and bind another. Here it's a hydrolysis reaction where you're breaking off one of the phosphates. And this is done or 
catalyzed by the GAP or the RGS proteins. Monomeric G protein, the one we're going to worry about is RAS. So, oh, darn it. it is a GDP GTP binding protein. You have a guanine exchange factor, and um, it's called SOS for RAS. It exchanges DTP for GTP. This makes RAS active. So all these down arrows are showing you what it can act on. And hopefully you start to see all these Ks, which means these are all kinases. And one of the um, concepts your textbook talks about is this signal amplification. And when you have one protein that can add phosphates to a bunch of proteins, right? And then they're all active and they can do other things. You have this amplification of the signal. And most of the time, it's a phosphorylation cascade. Phosphate, 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 phosphate. Um, something else I want you to notice when you're dissecting or looking at these pathways is if you see this little kind of T-bar, that means the pathway or the protein is blocked or inhibited. Okay. So SC1, whatever it is, blocks RAS G, uh, the RAS, sorry, gap. Okay. And remember, where am I? Gap over here is the one that helps hydrolyze GTP to G DP. Right? So if SC1 blocks this, then you're going to have RAS on all the time because you're blocking this pathway. These are the type of things I want you to be able to do when you see pathways, okay? If I give you something you have no idea what it is, that's fine because what I'm asking you is what it does. And so I would give you, okay, this blocking or I might say it activates it. And so you would know, oh, RAS activity turns over faster. You can see here, ERK1, ERK2 promote differentiation and they block self-renewal. But something else in this pathway, right, PI3K actually promotes self-renewal. So we've got crosstalk, we've got pathways interacting with each other through RAS. This is why I want you to have those pathways from the textbook with you. So that if I say I'm going to throw in SC1 and it blocks the RAS GAP, you can tell me, okay, well now I can figure out, that means these pathways are going to go, 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 go. And if you have tons of cell differentiation, that might not be so good. When we talk about cancer in our last chapter, and actually next chapter was cell cycle, you're going to find that it's a lot of signal transduction pathways that go bad that cause disease. Okay. Receptor tyrosine kinases. Again, you recognize these because it's a homodimer. The two little green pieces. Okay. Things to know about the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway. One, proteins that bind it have what we call an SH2 domain. That means it can bind a phosphorylated tyrosine. So this would be a tyrosine amino acid that gets phosphorylated. GRB2, once it binds, and this is how you're interpreting these pathways, once it binds the receptor tyrosine kinase, it interacts with SOS. 
Well, heck, we just talked about SOS is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So it's showing you right here, so, uh, blah, that's where SOS works, and you can see RAS GDP to RAS GTP. And I think I forgot to mention this last slide. Hopefully you can see RAS is also lipid anchored. RAS is our monomeric G protein, okay, which means it is active when it binds GTP. And what this is showing you is that when it binds GTP and is active, it binds to another protein called RAF, which has phosphate groups from this kinase. And the signal goes on to MEC, 1, 2, which is another kinase, to ERK, 1, 2, which is another kinase. So <clears throat> this, uh, erase all this ink for a second. This image right here also illustrates your three steps in signal transduction. Ah, signal transduction. Okay. Step one is receptor activation. And that happens by ligand binding. Okay. Ligands are considered the first messenger. Okay. They're the ones that initiate the whole pathway. One of your first objectives is to learn about autocrine, paracrine, juxtacrine, and endocrine. That's talking about what's happening up here. Who's making the ligand and who is receiving the ligand. Once the ligand hits its receptor and the receptor is activated, the next step is what we call signal transduction. And that's all of this. That's passing the signal on from receptor to protein to protein to protein with the final step in cell signaling, a cell response. Okay. Such as proliferation, which means cell division. Such as growth something with survival, so maybe it turns off some apoptotic um, genes. A lot of these signaling pathways send the signal to the nucleus where you turn on gene expression. So you can get a lot of information even if you don't know what each of these individual proteins are. So don't be intimidated by signal transduction. Go through and learn the basics of the receptors and the second messengers. Understand kinases, your G proteins, and then you can dissect any signaling pathway I give you. All right, one more receptor type to talk about for this chapter are the receptor serine threonine kinases. You are going to recognize them because they are made of two different types of receptors. The other characteristic of these pathways it they, is that they interact with proteins called SMAD. They have R-SMADs, which interact with the receptor. They have I-SMADs, which are inhibitors. And they have SMAD4, which is another SMAD binding protein. So you might go, well, I never learned about BMP ligands. Well, you don't have to, because what this, <clears throat> excuse me, um, image is showing you is that, oh, BMP ligands bind to serine threonine kinase receptors. 
I know that because it's two different looking receptors that come together. I know that because there's the SMAD pathway. Okay. And the SMAD pathway many times regulates transcription. Again, gene expression. And remember that these receptors are kinases. These are enzyme-linked receptors. So they're actually adding that phosphate group to the R-SMAD. Don't get overwhelmed. We're not talking about the co-receptor, the pseudoreceptor. Okay? We've talked about antagonists, right? Those block the action of the receptors. Yeah, we haven't talked about enhancers. Okay? Oh, here's a map kinase SMAD independent pathway. Oh, interesting, but you know what? I'm not asking you to analyze that. So don't get overwhelmed with everything. Focus on the question I'm asking. Dissect the pathway. Right? So we've talked about ligands being the primary messenger. They bind to the receptor. Things happen in the cell. Whoa! Okay. Oh. And please don't freeze because I don't know how to unfreeze you. So now you're catching up on your writing or you're taking a drink of water. And ta da. Okay, that's what I need an escape key. Or arrow button. Okay, yay. All right. Secondary messengers. Okay. There are three basic types. Hydrophobic ones, so these are ones that are going to interact with the membrane. Hydrophilic ones, which means they can move around in the cytoplasm or the cytosol. And gases. Okay. So we are talking about diacylglycerol, DAG. Phosphatidylinositols. <laughs> This is like PIP2 and PIP3. Hydrophilic ones. Talk about cyclic AMP. So you know, you should know. Adenyl, adenyl, adenyl cyclase makes cyclic AMP from ATP. Phosphodiesterase breaks down cyclic AMP to AMP. We've seen cyclic GMP in nitric oxide pathway. IP3, hopefully you know, comes from PIP2, IP3, and DAG. We've talked about calcium in um, muscle and nerve cells, and so we're going to talk about calcium as a secondary messenger in other pathways. We're not talking about carbon monoxide or hydrogen sulfide. Um, recognize these second messenger molecules. Um, let me say, know how they're formed, know where they come from, know the proteins. Again, filling in those charts that I've given you will get you covered with all of this information. So what if I gave you a um, um, pathway like this? First of all, what type of receptor? Okay. So you can see the ligand here in blue, and it's binding something, and it looks like a dimer. So I would say this is an RTK receptor. Interesting, okay, it's working on some protein and it's phosphorylating it. Well, that makes sense because it's a, a kinase. Okay. And this one is phosphorylating this protein, so this must be a kinase as well. And this is a kinase as well because it phosphorylated the M MNK1 protein to make it active, and it phosphorylated C-MYC to make it active. 
So be able to recognize which molecules are kinases. And kinases not only add phosphate groups to other molecules, but they are active when they are phosphorylated. Okay. Here's our cell response, production of proteins, transcription, translation. Maybe I'd put in here RAS. Or I'd put in here this. Some molecule with GDP, and I'd say, oh, this ligand activates it. Well, if you see GDP bound, you know it's a G protein. And if it's not a G protein coupled receptor, then it's going to be a monomeric. G protein. So since this is a receptor tyrosine kinase, it's a G protein monomeric, right? And you know that it needs to become GTP to be active and go on and activate other things. Maybe we have over here phospholipase C. And I might ask you, what type of phospholipase C is it? Well, you should know that phospholipase C gamma is activated by receptor tyrosine kinases. Phospholipase C beta is activated by G protein coupled receptors. What does phospholipase C do? Well, it breaks down PIP2 to IP3 and DAG. Hold on, I gotta check and make sure I didn't say that. Yeah, okay, PIP2. Okay, these are secondary messengers. Um, I've just gone through my notes, seeing what else I said you should know. Um, you would know that this protein has an SH2 domain because it interacts with the receptor tyrosine kinase and the phosphate on there. You would know that since this is a receptor tyrosine kinase, these guys autophosphorylate each other. So I can give you a bunch of little shapes with a little bit of clues and you can start telling me about this. Maybe I say, well, how, let's just get rid of everything. How would you stop translation? What could you do to stop translation? Okay, well, you see, okay, here's translation. Here's the arrow promoting it. So somehow I need to stop this phosphorylation. Okay. So maybe I stop this phosphorylation. Or maybe I block the receptor so it can't bind the ligand or, or somehow block this phosphorylation. Right. If I asked you about transcription, you would follow the arrows down and back and figure out how you could stop making C-MYC active. So you can take any um, signaling pathway that I throw at you and, and dissect it and understand it. Right. Here's a G-coupled receptor. So you know that this guy must be a trimeric G protein. That's what G-coupled receptors bind. Oh, it bound phospholipase C. What type? Well, phospholipase C beta, because that's what G protein couples receptors and trimeric G proteins activate. Oh, well, what is phospholipase C interacting with? Well, this must be PIP2, and it's making DAG, which stays in the membrane, and it's making IP3, which is hard to read, IP3, which is the sol soluble byproduct. Oh, and IP3, we know, binds the calcium channels in the ER, stimulates calcium release, 
DAG and calcium stimulate phosphokinase C. Phosphokinase C is a kinase, which means it's going to phosphorylate other proteins. Okay. Wow, NF, NF uh, kappa B platelet secretion. I don't know anything about this. That's fine. You don't have to. I'm going to pull different figures, and you're going to be able to tell me what you've learned from this chapter. Again, I've told you a number of figures from your textbook. I've even put them in a, a PowerPoint for you, so they're all in one place. Highly suggest you print them out, unless you want to remember all this. Right? There'll be questions about control of calcium. Right? It's, all, it's all right there how it gets in, how it gets out, how it's released from the ER. Again, here you can see G protein coupled receptors, G protein trimeric interact with phospholipase beta. You get PIP2 to IP3, IP3 interacts with the calcium channel. Oh, but you know what? You can stimulate this same pathway with a receptor tyrosine kinase because it activates phospholipase C gamma, which they're both phospholipase Cs. They do the same thing. They make IP3 and DAG. IP3 binds the calcium ion channels, releases calcium into the cell. As you're looking at your chart, you're like, oh yeah, and calcium can bind calmodulin, which is a regulator of other proteins. So we could keep drawing the pathway and the pathway and the pathway and the pathway. Right. Remember our friend, the ryanodine ry receptor? This is found in muscle and neurons. This is another calcium releasing channel. And remember in muscles this allows for contraction and in neurons this allows for exocytosis of the neurotransmitters. So take some time, fill out the charts, look through the pathways, go through the objectives, and when you come upon the quiz, and then eventually the unit exam and the final exam, you have these resources for you to help you sort through what these receptors do, who they interact with, what the second messengers do, how they're created, who they interact with. Right? That's it.